ago I sat here and proclaimed that the single biggest lack on my YouTube channel was Leibniz. Maybe that was never true. Now I had covered Thomas Reed in uh, in a number of discussions uh, of epistemology dealing with Hume and Kant and Alvin Plantinga. I talked about the ideas of Thomas Reed, but I never looked at Thomas Reed directly. Maybe I was wrong when I said Leibniz was the biggest lack. Maybe Thomas Reed was the biggest lack. We still don't have any direct look at Thomas Reed. Let's fix that. What uh, I'm beginning now is a series of videos for the, the Philosophers in Their Own Words playlist in which I look directly at some passages in Thomas Reed's An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. I will be using this nice edition edited by this chap, by Derek Brooks, and published by uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, no, Pennsylvania State, the Pennsylvania State University Press. Uh, so if all goes well, we'll have a series for the, the Philosophers in the Own Words playlist, and I may combine them for uh, hopefully a decent introduction to the text in the Great Text and Philosophy playlist. And then if all goes well, maybe the single biggest thing lacking on my YouTube channel will be Spinoza. Uh, let's hope all goes well. Now, uh, before we begin, let me give an extremely brief intro to who Thomas Reed is, and then, um, and then we'll go to the text for a better intro. Thomas Reed is a 1700s philosopher, and you can think of him as the alternative from the tradition of British philosophy in the early modern era, the alternative to David Hume. Hume is known as a variety of skeptic. I've uh, considered at length uh, exactly what kind of skeptic he is. He's not the kind of skeptic who denies things. He's the skeptic who doubts things. Hume is the skeptic who doubts that we have knowledge of things, who denies that we have knowledge of things, but does not deny those things. He says, uh, we believe these things uh, without knowing them. That, that's Hume. Uh, but Hume is still a, a variety of a skeptic. Thomas Reed is the non-skeptical, common-sense alternative. And if we leave, uh, if, if people watching this video and other videos in this series uh, leave it with one insight picked up, maybe it should be this insight, that common sense philosophy does not mean what most people think common sense philosophy means. It doesn't mean what most people think uh, is true at a particular time and place, as if uh, uh, geocentrism and then heliocentrism were common sense in different places, or as if the existence of God or the non-existence of God were common sense uh, in different times and places. Common sense means what pretty much everyone thinks. You can carve out a few exceptions for those who have been led astray by bad philosophy and a few uh, literally crazy people. Um, other than that, this is a very rough approximation of common sense, I hope you understand, but other, other than those uh, exceptions for people led astray by bad philosophy and people who are not entirely right uh, in how they think, other than that, what everyone agrees on, that is a much better approximation of what common sense is. So the existence of God, uh, geocentrism, heliocentrism, these were never common sense in any time and place. What was common sense was Propositions like I exist, uh, the world outside my mind exists, uh, reason is uh, reliable, my five senses put me in contact with the world outside my mind. These are common sense principles. More details to come soon in this book. Now let us begin with uh, the dedication and see what Reed says uh, to this Earl to whom he is dedicating the book. Or you could almost think of this dedication as a cover letter. My lord, though I apprehend that there are things new and of some importance in the following inquiry, it is not without timidity that I have consented to the publication of it. The subject has been canvassed by men of a very great penetration and genius, for who does not acknowledge Descartes, Malebranche, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume to be such? He is going to give a different philosophy to the philosophy of Descartes, Malebranche, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. And he's going to be uh, critiquing their philosophy, but he acknowledges uh, their greatness. He acknowledges that these are, are brilliant minds that have been studying principles of the human mind, principles of human knowledge. Uh, skipping a bit, however contrary my notions are to those of the writers I have mentioned, their speculations have been of great use to me and seem even to point out the road which I have taken. And your lordship knows that the merit of useful discoveries is sometimes not more justly due to those that have hit upon them than to others who have ripened them and brought them to the birth. Okay, so um, people like Descartes, Malebranche, Locke, Barclay, and Hume are people with whom Reed is disagreeing. But he acknowledges not only are they great minds, but their speculations have helped him find 
uh, the truth. Not so much uh, because they were correct, although they were correct on a number of things, but more because <laughs> they were wrong. They they helped show they helped show how 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 to be right uh, by by making certain mistakes. I suppose you could compare this to the the famous line attributed to Thomas Edison: uh, "Every time he failed to make a light bulb, he he succeeded in finding one way not to make a light bulb." Uh, it's a it's a little more sophisticated than that. It's um, let me see if I can uh, state this a little more briefly and succinctly. Uh, Descartes. Molly Brunch, Locke, Barclay, and Hume, besides being great minds, were, one, right on some particulars, and two, where they were wrong, uh, they showed ways to be wrong that are best avoided, and uh, that's two. And then three, I think we could say that Reed would say that these great minds, Descartes, Molly Brunch, Locke, Barclay, Hume, when they were wrong, also managed to show uh, certain ways of thinking which lead to certain conclusions. Now you want to consider those ways of thinking as much as uh, the details of what they think here and what they think here, or here they're right, here they're wrong. Uh, their methodology is just as important, perhaps more important than their conclusions. So you have to consider uh, their methods uh, just as much as the specific things they think. I acknowledge, my lord, that I never thought of calling in question the principles commonly received with regard to the human understanding until the Treatise of Human Nature was published in the year 1739. This is referring to a book by David Hume. The ingenious author of that treatise, upon the principles of Locke, who was no skeptic, hath built a system of skepticism which leaves no ground to believe any one thing rather than its contrary. His reasoning appeared to me to be just. There was therefore a necessity to call in question the principles upon which it was founded or to admit the conclusion. Kant is famous for saying that David Hume awakened him from his dogmatic slumber. Uh, it was not until until he studied Hume that Kant uh, discovered the importance of doubt and criticism of, of human thought, which led him in the direction of analyzing human thought and figuring things out properly, uh, partially because of what Hume got right, more importantly, because of the questions Hume got right, even if Hume didn't have the right answers, Kant thinks he can do better. Reed is surprisingly similar to Kant on this point, or maybe it's not surprising at all. I never thought of calling in question the principles commonly received with regard to the human understanding, that's the common sense principles, until the Treatise of Human Nature was published in the year 1739, until Hume taught him to doubt, or at least to question certain things Reed had never even thought to question common sense principle. And Reed built a system, uh, sorry, Hume built a system of skepticism, which leaves no ground to believe any one thing rather than its contrary, no grounds for uh, believing anything, a mere, a system of pure, pure doubt. But Hume's reasoning appeared to me to be just. Hume's reasoning was perfect. Hume's logic was flawless. The problem was the premises from which he was reasoning. And so uh, we need to question the premises of Hume. Now, in part, what Reed is interested in defending is the rationality of belief in uh, what has not, strictly speaking, been proven. This is skipping just a bit, he says, I am persuaded that the unjust live by faith as well as the just. Now, he's not commenting on scripture here. Uh, he is a Christian. He is, uh, I believe he's actually a Presbyterian minister of some sort, but this is not the point. Uh, he's using biblical language. There's the famous passage in uh, the book of Habakkuk quoted in, in the New Testament by Paul, uh, the just shall live by faith, or the righteous shall live by faith, or by faith the righteous shall, shall live. Uh, this is, at least as Paul's commentary takes it, this is uh, talking about salvation. Reed's not talking about salvation. Reed's talking about how we live. We live by trust, by faith. All of us, the just as well as the unjust. What sort of faith? That's what this book is meant to find out. Uh, well, to elaborate on, not only to find out, but also to analyze in detail. Not only what are the articles of this faith, but why do we believe this and why should we believe this faith? What sort of articles? Let's see if we can get some of that going. Well, it's the principles of common sense I gave you earlier, but sticking to the text. The day laborer toils at his work, and the belief that he shall receive his wages at night. If he had not this belief, he would not toil. We may venture to say that even the author of this skeptical system wrote it in the belief that it should be read and regarded even Hume had certain beliefs about what was going to happen. He believed people were going to read his books. I hope he wrote it in the belief also that it would be useful to mankind, and perhaps it may prove so at last. 
etc., etc. Uh, Hume believed in principles of common sense. Otherwise, he would never written his book and expected that people would read it. For I can see the skeptical writers to be said of men whose business it is to pick holes in the fabric of knowledge or if it is weak and faulty, when these places are properly repaired, the whole building becomes more firm and solid than it was formerly. The, the skeptical philosophers like Hume have the very important job, in fact, of finding weak spots in human thought and uh, exposing them so that then we can strengthen human thought by, by fixing the weak spots. For my own satisfaction, I entered into a serious examination of the principles upon which the skeptical system was, was built. I was not a little surprised to find that it leans with its whole weight upon a hypothesis, which is ancient indeed and hath been very generally received by philosophers, but of which I could find no solid proof. The hypothesis I mean is that nothing is perceived but what is in the mind which perceives it. That we do not really perceive things that are external, but only certain images and pictures of them imprinted upon the mind which are called impressions and ideas. Rewinding a bit, it was Hume's Treatise of Human Nature that first taught him to question. In the Treatise of Human Nature, Hume had built a skeptical system of thought based on the principles of Locke. And the reasoning of Hume was fine. The problem was the premises. Which premises? The premises of Locke. In particular, the hypothesis that nothing is perceived but what is in the mind which perceives it. We do not really perceive things that are external, but only certain images and pictures of them imprinted upon the mind. This is a fundamental error, borrowed from John Locke and followed by Hume into his skeptical philosophy. The error that I do not perceive, uh, for example, my DBU teacup. I don't perceive my DBU teacup, according to Locke. What I perceive is certain images or impressions of the teacup. Reed thinks that's not true. Reed thinks we actually do perceive actual things in the world. And if you can give an account of the fact that human beings perceive things in the world, then you can avoid all this uh, skepticism uh, with which Hume left us. But that means questioning the philosophy of perception of John Locke. And largely this book is meant to give us a better philosophy of perception. If this be true, if that Lockean presumption that we only perceive certain impressions of things, we don't perceive things themselves, if that is true, supposing certain impressions and ideas to exist in my mind, I cannot from their existence infer the existence of anything else. My impressions and ideas are the only existences of which I can have any knowledge or conception, etc., etc. This is actually uh, largely recounting the conclusions Barclay draws from the principles of Reed. So there's, there's lot. sorry, Barclay draws from the principles of Locke. There's Locke's principle that we only perceive uh, certain impressions of things. We don't perceive the things themselves. Then from that, Barclay derives his uh, idealistic philosophy, that is to say, all that is is mind and mind's perceptions. Uh, there's no um, matter outside the world. There's no physical teacup. There's only the, the perception of the teacup in minds. Uh, so there's Locke, then, then there's Barclay, then there's Hume's more extreme skepticism. Reed is, is looking at the whole thing and saying, oh, where it went wrong was that Lockean philosophy of perception. But the reasoning uh, these people, Barclay and Hume, draw from Locke's principles, that's good reasoning. The problem was the premises, the Lockean premises. I resolved, skipping a bit, to inquire into this subject anew without regard to any hypothesis. Uh, so he's, he's, not, uh, he's not necessarily going to spend a lot of time uh, critiquing Locke, Barclay, Hume directly. Uh, what he's going to do is take a direct look at human knowledge with emphasis on philosophy of perception and common sense. What I now humbly present to your lordship is the fruit of this inquiry, so far only as it regards the five senses, in which I claim no other merit than that of having given great attention to the operations of my own mind, and of having expressed, with all the perspicuity I was able, what I conceive every man who gives the same attention will feel and conceive. He's going to give us a better philosophy of perception here. He's going to focus on the five senses, and he's going to give us conclusions that he thinks every person will be able to agree with if they will just... If they will just pay attention to his reasoning and give it a fair look, because this is an appeal to common sense. Of course, everyone who has common sense and who is uh, sufficiently reasonable to consider Reed's analyses will surely agree. Uh, I conceive every man who gives the same attention 
will feel and perceive. Of course, not many people give the same attention as Reed. Uh, most people uh, take a, a very brief account, uh, largely a misunderstanding, uh, or, no, or at least an oversimplification of what someone like Thomas Reed says, and they proceed to agree, perhaps to disagree, and that's that. Um, you want to look at these things as carefully as you can uh, and analyze someone like Thomas Reed on his own terms, not based on some oversimplification. Uh, so we hope to get a better understanding of what actually is common sense philosophy. What is the philosophy of perception in this book? Uh, what is the alternative to that Lockean way that leads to Humean skepticism?